being treated to an extraordinary panel um, and especially to hear the personal reflection combined with the uh, academic insights and way in which the personal, the academic and the political intertwine. So, so what I would like to do is create a, a conversation between our panelists about some of the pressing issues that have arisen. Um, and the first one, which Professor Blank touched on but didn't really develop, was where we are now with COVID-19. Um, obviously, this has been one of the biggest global crises um, face, in the, at least in the 21st century globally. And, um, what I would like to know from, from, from the panelists is, is this, uh, are there opportunities or um, are there, and, and what are they, and are there detriments, and what are they? We know that everybody is um, equally um, exposed to the COVID-19, everybody is equally um, needing to take precaution. But it's also exposed some of the deepest inequalities in our societies, in all of our countries, and more globally. Um, but at the same time, would you say, and I, would, I, I wonder from Professor Blank, who mentioned your study, and you said we are we're at a watershed moment, I think he used the words, but didn't expand on that, you tantalizing said. Um, Professor Deschbinder, you talked about great consciousness and ablest bar um, barriers. And I wonder whether now that there is such a widespread facing of, of disabling barriers by everyone, by so many people in society, whether um, you think that uh, progress has been made towards recognizing these, disa these disabling barriers and to to the universality of, of all of our position, or you think, or perhaps, and you think, this um, has exacerbated inequalities, and particularly for people, academics with disabilities, lawyers with disabilities, there will be an uh, a, a, a absence of resources, um, fewer jobs, fewer possibilities going forward. So I wonder, Professor Blank and Professor Deshpande, as a start, perhaps you could uh, give your thoughts to uh, about this issue of COVID opportunities and detriments going forward um, as, as a kind of conversation between you. Uh, Professor P uh, Peach, I think you're still muted. Yeah, that's better. Oh, sorry. Thank you for that kind introduction. Maybe I can start with some pre-COVID numbers, if that's all right. For quite a large survey of lawyers, uh, by far, pre-COVID, the uh, highest uh, prevalence of disability was mental health disabilities. 31% of the lawyers had some form of, uh, reported some form of mental health disability as compared to 9% who were deaf and 4% who were blind and uh, in between mobility impairments. With regard to accommodation pre-COVID, uh, it was not usual that people would quote telework, 15%, 16%. Flex time was the biggest accommodation. And as Anna Lawson said and others, 8% uh, had issues with mobility and um, technology. Uh, in terms of discrimination, uh, highest proportion of reported discrimination was by intersectional categories of women, LGB, who have disabilities, women, uh, ethnic minorities, racial minorities, African American in particular, LGB and disability. Now, what's the relevance of that? And then I'll stop because I want to hear, I want others to, of course, comment. This is pre-COVID and we have uh, what might be considered a mental health epidemic in the legal profession. One of three lawyers almost uh, mentioned stress, anxiety, depression, substance abuse. Um, what will COVID and post-COVID entail with social isolation, with remote work, will organizations of lawyers and other organizations have different 
or new conceptions of what diversity and inclusion means in our society, given that there may be this increased social distance. In fact, many CEOs say they're going to continue the remote work policies and universities as well for large segments of their individuals. So I will close with your excellent question and defer to, to the other panelists. What will post and during COVID hold in terms of social and personal inclusion for individuals who are highly subjected to discrimination and who um, very often, as I said earlier, are not receiving the types of accommodations they've requested. I'll stop there. Now you're muted. Yeah, um, <clears throat> of course, um, so far as India is concerned, I believe that um, the policy of uh, social distancing has um, resulted in um, total lack of application of mind so far as uh, persons with visual disabilities are concerned. We are very much concerned about the fact that uh, even if you want to go for uh, buying essential commodities, uh, which were open during this uh, COVID uh, times, uh, you find that persons with disability uh, would not get the necessary help uh, which uh, is needed for uh, them to go out and uh, uh, have the access to the uh, essential um, I think commodities. So I believe um, uh, the, uh, uh, the basic principle that uh, before you formulate any policy with regard to COVID-19, uh, the persons with disability should have been uh, consulted. Another important aspect uh, which has happened so far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned is with regard to uh, the fact that um, there are uh, persons with uh, visual disability who are working as um, attendants in uh, hospitals, for example, where uh, corona patients were uh, there. And uh, therefore, um, uh, we had requested the government to grant exemptions from the uh, attendance uh, for uh, the job. Uh, but it came very late in the process, of course, during, until during that period, a number of persons with visual disability have uh, suffered from coma. Uh, sorry, uh, corona, uh, because of this, um, uh, and, you know, access um, being, um, you know, because of the access to these um, uh, COVID-affected patients. So I believe that uh, so far as COVID-19 is concerned, um, uh, there has no serious effort being made uh, with regard to the kinds of implications uh, which uh, such policies have. Uh, with regard to persons with uh, versus with disability, and in particular persons with uh, visual disability, so I believe that um, uh, we need to be more assertive in terms of the kinds of accommodations which are needed. Because I will look at the exemption from uh, daily attendance in offices, for example, and if it is possible for you to work from home, as we have been doing as teachers uh, from home, we have been engaging classes. So there may be certain kinds of jobs uh, which you cannot perform uh, from work from home. So I believe in such cases, um, you know, need to be sensitive to the uh, differences and the kind of consequences which might be produced by insisting on applying the same rule uh, to all uh, persons with disability. Thank you. May, may I say in our studies that the individuals with disabilities lacked no assertiveness. The organizational culture did not respond. That, was, yeah, that yeah. was the real challenge. That's I agree with you. Same is the case here also. Uh, thank you. you. I wonder if any of, of our other panelists want to come in on, on this point. Does anyone sense opportunities coming out of the COVID uh, in terms of a greater awareness <laughs> of the safety barriers or, or bleak? Well, there, there is a current... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, please, please continue. Peter, please continue. Michael, please continue. No, I, I, will... I was just going to say it. our group has just put out a paper called The Silver Linings from COVID. Obviously, there's not many, but, but the, the transition to remote work and technology driven uh, personal dynamics, we believe, might greatly change attitudes, we hope, about technology accommodations. You said it. Same thing I wanted to say. The new normal of pandemic has really brought uh, this transformation. Uh, uh, since not very long ago, 
if a person with disability I ask for work from home, the eyebrows would be raised. But now work from home is a normal. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I think you wanted to come in on this as well, did you? No, Peter, Peter covered it quite well. I would just cover the negative side of it, which is to remember mm -hmm. that in some parts of the world, you know, people with disabilities are having trouble accessing the internet and ITC. And so, you know, when I do my lectures out of Pretoria or out of Western Cape, many of the students, you know, have difficulty getting online or if they are online, they keep their visuals off so as to preserve bandwidth. Um, and we need to think about them. But the, there is certainly a, a difficult time for employers to argue at the moment that you need to be physically present. Um, but at the same time, we also need to be mindful of social inclusion. And while it's always good to be empowered for your employment, um, it's also good to be physically present and interacting with your peers. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panel for, for, for these insights. And I'm sure this is going to be an ongoing conversation um, going forward. Um, I want to ask, uh, move on to a, a slightly different point, which is um, all of our esteemed panelists um, are e experts and at the forefront of developing disability studies. And I was wondering um, whether we could talk a little bit more about whether this puts um, an inordinate responsibility on, on lawyers with disabilities to be at the forefront of developing uh, disability studies or the opposite. And I'm talking from the experience of feminism and, and gender, where on the one hand, it was very important to have women at the forefront of, of gender studies and women taking these issues forward. But on the other hand, there was a risk of it becoming ghettoized. There were, it, it was, could well be marginalized just by the very fact that um, it had always been devalued. So I wonder what your experience is. I was very struck by um, Michael Professor Stein. You mentioned at the beginning that you see very few lawyers with disabilities in commercial law uh, conferences. Um, Anna, Anna Lawson, you mentioned on the other hand that you're very glad to move from teaching property law to teaching disability studies and equality. So again, is this um, is there a risk that this is a big responsibility on 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 lawyers with disabilities? Is it crucial that uh, this is where the voices are heard? And on the other hand, should we be moving as again with with um, the experience of feminism? Should we be moving to mainstreaming? Should we be moving to a situation in which rather than disability being um, you know, specialized and on the side, as far as academic research is concerned, it should be mainstreamed in the way that um, Sanjay Jain mentioned at the end, constitutional public law textbooks should be incorporating uh, disability insights, for example, into everything. So um, I wonder, um, um, Michael, Professor Stein, whether you want to start um, on this issue. Oh, my pleasure. Um, it, is a, it is a privilege and a, and a pleasure to be able to teach in disability law and to try to create an environment that's inclusive and that includes perspectives of advocates and others. So I don't see it as a responsibility. I see it as a privilege. I do think we have authenticity in the way that that word is used in a way that other group members have authenticity to have insights and represent their views. But it's a large tent and pulling in others who are outside that group, I think only makes the subject matter stronger. Um, Sanjay's point is very well taken though. Um, and you know, when one thing that I try to do is I cross teach. And so, you know, besides teaching at the law school, the medical school, the Kennedy School of Government, um, the Ed School and the Extension School. I also go to college classes um, and I will lecture at the School of Public Health when someone's teaching mental health. I will lecture on child uh, security when they're teaching that. Um, and I will lecture in the human rights courses of my friends and just offer to do that as a way of ensuring that disability is being mainstreamed. But then as Sanjay points out, there are entire areas where things are missing. So. 
you know, I just wrote the first article on business and human rights and disability. There is zero published on it. It went out to peer review and the two first peer review publications rejected it on the grounds that I didn't reference the literature when there is no literature. Um, and, you know, I got frustrated with it. And so my friend Ilias and I um, are doing the Cambridge Companion to Business and Human Rights coming out this spring. And I'm doing it for the sole purpose of being able to have a chapter in it on disability, which is the flea wagging the tail, wagging the dog. So we need to do it on both fronts, both fronts. Um, can you hear me? I'm not sure whether I'm on mute or unmute at the moment. Can you hear you? Oh, oh, lovely, thank you. Um, we can't see you. No, sorry, point. I've lost my screen on my phone, so I'm finding it difficult to adjust <laughs> adjust its settings. That's right, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yes, I, I agree with Michael and the points that have been made completely. And, and I think um, there is a danger of ghettoization. And um, it is it, part of the responsibility of all of us, I think, who are working in disability law areas, including non-disabled people, is to um, widen the reach of the subject to draw more people into it, whether they're disabled or not. But I think it's also really important that whoever does come into it does retain um, a, a level of respect and um, concern about the voice of disabled people, which is at the heart of disability studies. Um, and the other thing I think I wanted to say on this is that Within disability law, certainly in the UK, there's been a tendency for quite a lot of fragmentation. So there's a group of people who come in from a background in mental health, um, but tend not to go out of that to other types, other parts of disability law. Um, and similarly with social care or equality and just having those conversations across the internal legal disciplines is really important as well. I, I, if I could just pile on what you said about including people with disability, I think is um, really important when you're, um, particularly in when we're talking about disability, having people with disability have you in a voice. Today I was um, chairing a panel where we're talking about um, disability action plans and strategic approaches. And I, I pointed out that there was, that there was two people on the, um, in this group that had disabilities, both of whom were blind and obviously blind people are wonderful people, but you know, to, doesn't represent the whole disability community. There, there was no one in a wheelchair. There was no one, with, you know, this, and that wasn't um, that wasn't representative. And also, the other thing is, I, I asked, how would you, how would it go down if we had a um, a panel of white men talking about uh, women's uh, pregnancy issues in the workplace? It, it, it wouldn't fly. You would, it would be seen as unacceptable. Why should it be acceptable to have? people in organizations or in the community talking about people with disability, but not having people with disability, not just on it, but leading that group. Um, so, yes, and I, I, I was wondering then... And, uh, may I come in for a brief comment? Uh, yes, I was uh, going to ask you, Sanjay, whether you could comment on how we actually get to where you want to be. How do we get to having disability studies more mainstream to the way in which you're suggesting? Yeah, uh, uh, I believe, I agree with Anna that first of all, we have to avoid fragmentation. And uh, secondly, uh, we have, in order to uh, dispense with uh, ghettoization, we need to include more uh, so-called non-disabled scholars into uh, disability uh, uh, law. Of course, that does not mean that teaching disability law is a burden. I agree, I entirely agree with uh, Michael that teaching disability law is a pleasure. In fact, uh, more you go into disability law, more tolerant, more open, more accommodative you become even in your thinking, right? And most importantly, why we look at disability uh, in terms of binary. Why, for example, we look at disabled and non-disabled as a binary? Why can't we accept the simple fact that disability is an evolving concept and anybody can become disabled? So disability is something which is around the corner and can strike anybody anytime. So I think uh, disability law basically is a is a domain which, we, which would make us plastic in our thinking, which would make us elastic in our imagination. 
which would make us more meditating in uh, our in introspection and therefore to confine it to disabled and therefore i sometimes feel very disappointed most of the times people ask me to i mean particularly from outside most of the time i get invitation to speak on disability law as if i am not good enough in other uh, public law or contract law or property law etc etc so i think to to provide right place to disability legal studies the word coined by professor sajit mor i think it is important uh, that more and more so called non disabled people uh, start taking interest in it and not uh, to empathize with people with disability probably but to probably make themselves more inclusive make themselves more accommodative make themselves more tolerant can i uh, just uh, make one point small point yes yes please do yeah um see i have also uh, worked with national federation of the blind uh, since last uh, 21 years so what uh, uh, you know loyal start with an advantage because it's an art of persuasion so they have the ability to pinpointly uh, point out what are the problems and also give nuanced uh, focus upon uh, the problems which are being faced and also come out with um, uh, diversity sensitive kind of solutions so definitely lawyers start with an advantage so, so far as um, the professional art of persuasion is concerned and in that sense advocacy uh, dimension of the um, uh, the disability sector can be taken uh, can be certainly led by lawyers but i think uh, important um, you know, contribution can be made by uh, recognizing the plurality within the disability sector itself for example not only uh, within the within the say uh, visually challenged uh, individuals you have a wide variety of um, you know people with different degrees of disability and different degrees of accessibility problems uh, quite apart from the interdisability uh, dimensions of uh, pluralism in in, in uh, disability itself i think what um, uh, we had uh, as a um, you know national federation though we tried to have a, a common disability forum but unfortunately uh, each one has its own uh, identity and therefore they were not willing to uh, come together and form a, a form a common disability forum but i believe uh, i take the point that uh, there should not be alienation of um, uh, the others um, and therefore lawyers have to be careful in uh, seeking the inputs uh, from uh, the cross sections of uh, disability mm -hmm. and also the plurality of um, interests which uh, they they are supposed to represent thank you uh thank you very much and that really leads on to um my next question which is uh you talked about the challenges of alliances within the disability movement um and i wonder whether you you could talk a little bit more about alliances between the disability movement and uh, and other groups um obviously there are intersectional issues um but um with that in the picture alliances with uh with women with lgbtqi people with um uh, with in, in relation to race um you talk peter very interestingly that your study included both um and you looked at lgbt I, th i think you looked at lgb women and people with disabilities i wasn't sure if you look we're looking at the intersection uh, of that um we, we and, were. Uh, and then you talked about um that there was an increasing focus on race in and obviously the decolonization curriculum mm -hmm. which is happening in law schools here so i wondered whether these are now turning into somewhat con um whether there are conflictual issues who can get the most attention or whether these are solidarity issues where alliances can be formed and where does intersectionality come into all of that so peter um yes did you want to come in first oh well i i didn't want to interrupt anna but yes we looked at uh disability and sexual orientation and gender identity particularly because there are aspects of disclosure that are required often and they are among the least studied the least voice present in the legal profession in terms of um uh moving forward in terms of diversity and inclusion uh i i will stop there but say that um uh for those of us who are very focused on the mental health community 
uh, that that represents large, large numbers of both law students and lawyers. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested to hear uh, others' comments about uh, the nature of that particular compare, uh, condition, which of course cuts across all types of intersectionality as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anna, you yes. welcome this. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, really interesting question, and I think very timely. And, and I think it's really important that we do use it as an opportunity, every opportunity to, to promote solidarity rather than conflict between groups that are pushing for very similar types of um, inclusion and equality. Um, and I think there are there are specific organizations that focus on intersectional issues like there's there's um, some excellent organizations that that focus on disability and gender but i was really struck by something i heard from um the chair of stonewall a couple of weeks ago and he was saying which is a an lgbt organization and he was basically saying that everything they do um takes an intersectional approach, sectional approach. So whenever they're doing research on LGBT issues, they'll make sure that they include a disability and a race and a, you know, a broader gender dimension and a religion dimension because that actually enriches the data. And I think that's, um, that's a really good type of thing to think about. So when there are decisions that have to be made about prioritization, um, like in terms of scholarships, who's going to get scholarships or that kind of thing, just just ensuring that an intersectional dimension is embedded within any any priority that's made. Um, and I think learning from each other is really, really important. The disability disability law has so much to learn from gender law. And I think at the moment we have so much to learn from the decolonization approach um, that's been associated with Black Lives Matter and movements like that. Um, and so much applies to, to the disability context as it does to other marginalized groups too. And I think working together across those divides is really important. Um, Sanjay, you've worked on, I think, gender and um, the law as well. And yeah. perhaps you could talk, come in on this one too. Uh, it's a shame that uh, I have not uh, done much on, uh, in, I'm not done uh, uh, much uh, on disability vis-a-vis -vis intersectionality. But uh, of late, I've started uh, thinking in terms of intersection of disability with other uh, social issues. And particularly, I'm, I'm, I will be very much interested to uh, join an alliance with, uh, for example, Dalits or LGBTQ in India. Uh, uh, because uh, as Anna very rightly said, we have much, uh, a lot to learn uh, from these moments. And I think, these moments are far more matured and far more stronger and probably uh, they have far more greater aura around them. And therefore, we have to probably, um, as, a, as a group, uh, we have to uh, uh, solidify ourselves. We have to, rather than uh, trying to be in conflict with them, rather than in trying to be in antagonized, antagonistic relationship with them, I think it would be, it would be very interesting if we join hands with them, join alliance with them. I think that may be one of the projects, which may be one of the inputs, uh, so far as I'm concerned, of, of this summit. Thank you. I, I think we're probably running out of time. Um, um, but so how I'd like to end is perhaps each of the uh, panelists could, could give us one sentence or perhaps two sentences on what do you think is the most important issue for uh, legal academics and lawyers in, in, in relation to disability? What do you think is the most important issue going forward that we should prioritize? I know that's a difficult one because there are many, but perhaps just choose one that you can mention in two sentences um, uh, by way of ending this, this part of the discussion. Um, would you like to start, Peter? It's just because you're on the top right hand corner of my screen. <laughs> oh, well, what an excellent question. And I, I have to start uh, when children are young in the educational system. There's, there is no meaningful mm. pipeline into the legal academy or law schools 
of people with disabilities, and that's reflected in the number of individuals who who disclose disabilities and go into the legal profession or academics. That's five sentences. Thank you so much. Uh, cool. Yeah, related to that is when the, I we get into the position that, for example, Peter found that the the wealthy partner gets the accommodation, but the junior partner, junior lawyer doesn't. Well, I think as a legal, a legal academic becoming a bit more senior, I get opportunities where they're prepared to make accommodations or adjustments for me because I am where I am. The same, um, so I think it's, it's it's good for me to then say, well, let, no, don't just fix it for me. Let's let's put this into a, a situation or policy so it fixes it for everyone, and then I can benefit from the policy that applies to everyone. Because I'm in, a, you know, we're in a situation where we can get that. We're more likely to get that change made with than the person behind us who can't advocate for themselves or make the policy shift. Which was more than one. Thank you, Paul. Um, Michael, can you would, would you go next? Sure. Um, I think in 2020, between the pandemic and between the divisive right-wing neoclassical politics that are dominating much of the planet. We need to think about we societies rather than me societies and work towards solidarity and unity and see our commonality and our mutual interest and respect on how to create better societies. And that includes disability since it's a cross-cutting issue. Thank you. We societies rather than me societies. What are your thoughts, Anna? Anna. <laughs> Gosh, it's, it's hard to follow that one. <laughs> um, I think for me, it's um, embedding disability critique in, the, in mainstream law teaching. And that may need initially to come from people who have some specific expertise in disability issues or a collaboration like Michael's been doing, where you know, he goes in to, to teach on other people's courses but embedding it into the teaching and also embedding it into textbooks. Thank you, thank um, you, Anna. Shirish um, Deshpande, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, Deshpande, sir, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, 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 Sandra, till sir comes, uh, should I should I um, uh, come in? Yes, please. While we're waiting for yeah, uh, yes, my uh, yeah yeah my my thoughts are I, I cannot but agree with Anna. I cannot agree but agree more with Anna. Uh, but uh, I want to emphasize on visibility, uh, visibility of disability academician in mainstream conferences. For example, I have attended all Icon S conferences. I especially went to South Africa to critique uh, Professor Bhavantara de Santos. And I told him uh, how his uh, uh, Southern epistemology, although it is transformative, it is completely ableist. And to my surprise and to my, 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 my great satisfaction, he conceded that yes, uh, even if uh, his uh, southern, uh, southern epistemology is transformative, uh, it is ableist. So I think if you are vis if you maintain your visibility and if you are upfront and cohesive in your thoughts, uh, as a disabled scholar, you can make a lot of difference uh, to mainstream uh, legal scholarship. Can, can you Thank hear you me now? Much. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, Shirish, we can hear you now. Okay, yes, yes, so we can hear you. Please uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, what I, I suggest is uh, that uh, so far as cross-disability uh, forums are concerned, I believe that um, so far as demands of rights are concerned, there can be uniformity of demands of rights, what kinds of rights you are demanding, but there may be diversity of remedial responses. So I believe uh, the truth lies in this fact that, okay, we may, uh, be, uh, we may show solidarity in uh, demanding rights, but the remedial responses are bound to be different. Then that should not uh, result in uh, conflict of interest at all. So even when, for example, we talk about uh, women with disability and, and uh, the um, gender movement, I think um, uh, we have to take into account the uh, intersectionality dimension so far as women with disability as well are concerned. I think there will not be any incompatibility as such, I believe. Thank you. 
Well, thank you to everybody for really an, a, a, a really wonderful panel, for sharing your insights, your experience, your expertise, and also for this uh, great conversation that we've had now. Um, I think it's been a, a wonderful panel and, and one which will really be very memorable. So um, should I hand over to you, Swati, to, to do the questions? Because yes. I'm not at all sure where we are with time. <laughs> and thank yes. you to our moderator. Absolutely. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Well, I'm off to bed. More than a pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm, I'm uh, uh, Swati, madam, we should take at least uh, two, three questions to be uh, fair to audience. Yes, if, sir. If yes, all, there are. Oh. So I have uh, two questions here uh, on the chat. I'll just read it for you. Uh, we have a question from DK Chopra. And actually, it's not one question. It's two questions. Uh, the first question is, is there any difference between quality of teaching between one suffering disability and one non? Is there reservation and relaxation in academic qualification for teachers suffering disability outside India? Um, Michael, can you take that? Uh, outside India, are there quotas for uh, disabled teachers? Uh, there are no quotas, and to my knowledge, there's no affirmative action or finger on the scale, although since 2000, many U.S. law schools will include disability as one of their diversity characteristics. Um, and as far as lower lower uh, workloads or anything else, I, I think it's quite the opposite. Many of us are, are feeling much like, at least in my generation, feel like the generation of women and people of color ahead of us, that we have to be over the top productive as opposed to mm. anything else. But maybe that's my own neurosis. Uh, no, I don't think it is. We, we um, did our, our university survey for the first time included disability. Um, our university is quite old, so we, this, it's, I think it's very, it's very surprising that we've gone to how many, 50 of them and never include disability. And now we have, um, and the numbers of people with disability aren't very high. Um, but there was a large group of people that refused to admit whether they had or, dis had or did or did not have a disability, which is, I suspect they had disabilities. And I think um, just responding to the first point there, um, I think disabled people can be just as good teachers as non-disabled people, um, sometimes better, um, because you're being creative very often all the time and making people think in ways they may not have thought before. Um, but we do need accessibility and we do need support around systems that are not um, usable by us for one reason or another. Right. Yes. Thank you for those answers. Um, the same question, I mean, a uh, same person has second question. Uh, is there any study of behavior, behavioral change to deterrence of students like doubting if students do mischief? For example, a blind teacher may doubt students are running from the classes. So I think we need to reframe the question. Um, so, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, how to how to how to ensure uh, that both uh, teachers and students they remain they remain cordial to uh, one another. For example, neither student teachers must doubt too much about students, nor students must doubt too much about teachers. I mean, if I've understood right. the question, right? right? Yeah. Yes. Anybody uh, else? Uh, yeah. Yes, would you sir. like to respond? Uh, maybe uh, Peter would like to take that. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Anna. Me? What did you say? Um, yeah, so I, I think this is where um, being open and respectful to each other really matters. And in a university, really, although they may be 18, you, you're not dealing with, um, you know, very young children. They are essentially adults. And I've certainly found that if, if you explain to them what what you're you know how you're working, 
So, so my tactic, for instance, when there's quite a lot of whispering or noise in the room is to say, to remind them that I can't read quickly enough to read out all my notes. So I'm having to remember what I've got to say. And if they make a lot of noise, I'm going to get distracted and not be able to continue the lecture. And the, then they usually go incredibly quiet. So I think it's, it's important to be open um, about what you need them to do in order to, to support them to, to get the learning they need. And I've certainly never, never found, um, once I've been open with them, I've never found any, any question of doubt, really. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were to briefly uh, come in, uh, yes. I become sometimes ableist. Uh, when, when I feel <laughs> troubled in the class, I say, okay, friends, I want to see through your eyes. Right? And then the atmosphere trans is transformed and st students are extremely friendly. Yes. So, uh, the same person has the third question. How address person suffering temporary or transactional disability who needs, whose needs are same as disabled? Jen, sir? Uh, so, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, Peter, can you, can you please come, on, can you come in and help us? Uh, transitional and tem uh, temporary disabilities, how to address? Well, I can, I can at least give a uh, American-centric perspective, yeah. and that is we've, we've revised our Americans with Disabilities Act yes. to include both uh, a temporary, potentially, and um, uh, episodic and non-episodic disabilities. So there's a greater awareness of temporary impairments, particularly in the area, for example, of mental disability others might have a different sense from a from an international perspective michael stein or others well i'll just that we treat all students as as individuals and hopefully mainly and and in and in tandem with them and you know everyone has a need for an accommodation whether it's disability temporary disability parenting family family needs, especially now in COVID. And we just try to accommodate and act humanely and, and in an inclusive manner for, for all our students and, and for others. Um, I mean, practically, I think temporary person who's got a broken leg, um, they, within the, in the workplace, for example, they've got a temporary injury, they're gonna be rehabilitated back into the workplace. So the, the law, is, the whole structure is that this person has a temporary injury and they'll be back. If it's going to be permanent, it's like it would be a different situation. But um, and particularly with how strongly they're going to advocate a person who's who has a broken arm is doesn't have years of oppression or um, experiencing knockbacks. They've got this broken arm. Why the hell can't you go? I have the door open for me when I get there. They're they're not going to be um, as easily quietened. And um, so, in a way, I think that that could be it is something useful to build upon that a change can be made by someone who shouts very loudly. Yes. I, yes, yes, Professor Anna. Yeah. I, I think maybe a linked issue, it's slightly separate, but a linked issue is, is when somebody has employment and become acquires some kind of illness or the beginning of a, an impairment that's likely to be long term, um, at the moment, a lot of countries around the world have very poor records on retaining those staff. They tend to disappear from the workforce. Mm -hmm. So I think a flexible approach to periods of disability leave, um, which will allow people to maybe acquire new skills or new, learn new ways of doing things, or just right. get time, you know, time to adapt is, is really, really important. Right, right. Yes. Thanks a lot uh, for that answer. Uh, next question we have from Jasmine Kosla, and her question is specifically addressed to Professor Peter Blank. Um, she says, how has the situation and circumstances regarding the disabled people being subject to discrimination evolved over time? And what changes should be made to make things better for them? Professor Peter. Yes, it's, it's a very good question. In addition to studying reports of discrimination, we have a ton of data, which I didn't talk about, 
on ways that people believe that discrimination can be mitigated in their firms and which have been mitigated in their experience. And uh, obviously among the top are uh, uh, close, meaningful mentoring relationships as well as meaningful affinity groups. Unfortunately, in the United States, at least in the legal profession, there is, there is a lot of money spent by large and medium-sized law firms on topics of diversity and inclusion. But as I said, very little movement uh, towards the, uh, of the needle. Uh, that is why also we are very excited that our studies will be longitudinal in nature, which means because of our privacy algorithms, we can do it properly. We will not only be tracking people voluntarily in, in accord with our human subjects uh, provisions over time, but also cross-sectionally as a cohort. So we will look at pre and post issues, COVID, job transition, and so forth. So we hope that uh, will provide additional information. Oh, sure. Yeah, we, I'm sure all of us would be looking forward to the research findings, Professor Blank. Uh, we have next question from Luz Paula Yori. And uh, Luz says that uh, she herself is a person with psychosocial disability and she aspires to be part of uh, academia. So her question is, how can we include people with disabilities, especially psychosocial disabilities in the academia? Uh, uh, this, this again is a very important question as I tried to suggest earlier. One of mm -hmm. my closest colleagues and friends is a woman uh, named Ellen Sachs, who's a MacArthur Genius Fellow, uh, who is a very distinguished professor of law at the University of Southern California and who also is a woman with schizophrenia. And she writes very poignantly, poignantly about her experiences in a best-selling book called The Center Cannot Hold, which I would reference to you about her, her challenges and opportunities as a woman with severe psychosocial uh, disability engaged in the legal profession and in law school. Right, yes. Thank you, Professor Blank, for those um, sharing of that example and answering the question. Um, Jen, sir, we are done with the questions. Okay. Can, um, we, can, we, can we ask Rahul to quickly have a, yes, a, a yes. last word, very quickly, maybe two minutes, and then we'll proceed yes. to formal vote of thanks. Yes, Rahul, please take over. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Thanks everyone. It's been I have been li li listening with rapt attention to the conversation for the last two two and a half. I think Rahul has lost his connection. Yes, we'll just yeah, wait yeah. for a moment. Yes, we'll yes. just wait for a moment. Yes. Yes. <sighs> While we are waiting, where is the blog and the information that people might want to refer to? Uh, uh, we have already, uh, uh, Peter, we have blog, uh, we have put all your articles on the blog of the event uh, for uh, all the audience to uh, read. Yeah, we have put uh, all the articles. Uh, as well as others as well? Yeah, yeah. For for uh, for anybody who, who who wants to read, the blog is accessible. It's open access. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Swati, madam, maybe yes. you can show the link. Yes, yes. I've just shared it, uh, Professor Blank. I've shared the link here. Uh, you can just uh, check on this link. Thank you. You no, are. So I think we'll have to yeah. remind Rahul once. Just a minute. I will remind. Otherwise, we'll we'll proceed with vote of thanks. Yes, sir. Just a minute. I think the call has gone.
ओके ही हैज अ बैटरी इश्यू सो मैम यू कैन प्रोसीड विद व्हाट आई थिंक्स ओके नो प्रॉब्लम सर so with that we come towards the end and um, i am indeed privileged to uh, deliver this vote of thanks so uh, i convey my heartfelt gratitude to maria solidar sitsvinas for sharing her video message and taking time out for us professor michael ashley stein professor peter blank professor anna lawson professor paul harper dr shirish deshpande uh, professor sandra friedman for such a wonderful moderation uh, Ms. Vijayanti Joshi and Dr. Sanjay Jain for all their support and guidance. Uh, I would also convey my heartfelt gratitude to Rahul Bajaj for his valuable contribution to the concept note and, of course, the prompts that he has created for the resource persons. I thank Bar and Bench for being our publicity partners, Radio Udan for being our media partners. Uh, I would fail in my duty if I don't thank my colleagues Varsha Khandagle, Aparna Tatke, Ashish Pawar, uh, Swati Kulkarni, Rohit Bokil, Madhukar Togam, Yogesh Mistri, uh, student Atharva Dewey for his uh, contribution in video, and uh, most importantly, all of you for being such a uh, participative uh, audience. Thanks a lot, and uh, hope to see you tomorrow again for the day two session. Uh, thank you all, and have a nice day ahead. Yeah, uh, tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's session is dedicated to lawyers. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I want Thank all you. of you uh, in same numbers to attend the session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Apar. Thank you.